Hey there, Dorian. Hello. It's good to see you again today. Uh, Likewise. So for anyone who doesn't know Dorian, uh, thank you for joining us. Um, Dorian's an instructor here on Proco. Um, you you have your shading course. Uh, you've been fantastic in giving feedback on Proco in general. Um, they've seen you in free lessons, plenty of other videos on Proco. Um, if you got if you guys don't know, Pro, uh, Dorian also has his own website where you can follow along with other courses with him. Um, you can get to uh, just keep in keep in touch, keep informed on what Dorian's up to. Um, there's a, uh, as well as your course being updated recently on Proco, you're also, I think, soon having the direct feedback version of that course. Yes, I think in 10 days, April 3rd, we're starting the shading course on shadycourse.com, which happens only twice a year. So if you want to work directly with me, that would be a good option. Otherwise Dang. on Proco, there's the self-study version of the shading course with the same content there. All right. Magnificent. Um, I think, honestly, th this is a version of um, a lecture that you have given before. I'm just kind of here to introduce you and kind of moderate the comments a little bit. Um, so I think I'm actually just going to go ahead and throw over to you to introduce this course a little bit. Sounds good. Yeah, here you go. Hey, Steven. Hi, everyone. Welcome. This is an updated version of a talk I gave in November at the career camp that THU is running, I think, twice a year. And it got really, really good feedback. And it's a topic or a you know, complex of topics that's really close to my heart. Um, I want to make this next hour or so really useful for you, really practical. And there are three parts. We'll start with basic frameworks and then tools, approaches that you can use that are well-researched and that I have used for myself too, to help me navigate the ups and downs of life as life, like as a person, and also specifically as an artist. And then the third part is action, where you get to choose what you are going to do next in your artistic practice and your life. And then at the very end, we'll have time for questions. It's Q&A, but I don't know if how much A, how much answers I will have, but it's a place where you can kind of have a dialogue about these topics as a community. So thank you for being here, for making time for this. And I'd like to start with a short um, orienting practice to kind of arrive in this moment. So wherever you are, take a look at your environment, the room around you. you know, travel or let your eyes travel around the room slowly, as if you're looking at a painting Maybe you notice your field of vision kind of widening a bit, becoming aware of different textures, materials. And it's important to do this slowly. So just kind of travel with your eyes. You can look up at the ceiling maybe and let your head follow the movement of your eyes. Slowly, like gently, maybe go Look behind you, turning your head. Maybe see what's underneath, like on the floor, which we don't often look at, the ceiling and the floor, I think. Just take a moment to explore. and find things that you've not noticed before, which is an important skill as an artist, I think. And then come forward again, like to the, your field of vision in front of you and pick something to rest your eyes on, something you enjoy looking at. If it feels good, you can also close your eyes for a moment while I explain what happened in the last few minutes in your body physiologically that these slow movements of your eyes and of your head activating the muscles in your neck is sending a signal to your nervous system to shift into the rest and digest mode or to take the gas or take the foot off the gas pedal 
like to slow down, come into the present moment. And we'll touch on this kind of dynamic interaction between thinking in the mind, what we typically locate in the head, and the effects in the body and how that connection is going both ways. Top down from the head, mind into the body and bottom up by, let's say, working with breathing to affect how your internal state is. Cool. Thank you for allowing me to do that and for following along. So I want to make this practical and useful and tangible. So I'm going to start with a question for you, which is, why are you here? You know, what are you hoping to learn in the next hour with me, with us here? Write this on paper, physically. If you really don't have anything around you that you can use to write on, use a digital device. But if you, if there's any way you can do it physically, do that. I'll give you half a minute or so. It can be just spontaneously what comes to mind. You can revise it later. And this is for you, private. What are you hoping to learn? All right, I'm going to keep going. If you're watching the recording of this, you can also do that for yourself, which will lead to you at the end of this having something in your hands that you can work with. So a bit about me. I, my name is Dorian. I draw, paint, sculpt, and teach. And as I was preparing for this talk, I realized that a fun connection, um, my focus has been light and shadow. The shading course that I teach passionately at some point was called Mastering Light and Shadow. And the, the psychological internal aspect is also in a way about light and shadow, about the conscious and the unconscious, Carl Jung would call shadow. So there's a, a nice symmetry. And today in this talk is more about that, what is happening inside of us as we go through life and as we are creating work. My training artistically was very classical. I studied in Florence in an atelier type school, which I'm super grateful for my teachers there. I really went very deep into the craft and really enjoyed that way of working, working from life, you know, no computers, <laughs> everything done in oil and charcoal and pencil. But I was also interested in digital art. So I was teaching myself Photoshop and ZBrush and all these things. And then actually studied after graduating in Florence, um, studied in the US doing entertainment design. And so now my life is like mostly teaching, but I do some commissioned artwork and I do some work in entertainment. I recently had a project in visual development for an animated series, which was super fun. And my personal work, like that is a, a whole big topic that I'm not going to open too much, like my relationship with my art making which is really, like, there's a lot of friction there, a lot of internal pressure, a lot of stuff. And my personal work tends to come out really dark. So I don't show it because I feel like there's so much darkness and heaviness and suffering in the world around us that I don't want to contribute to that and add more heaviness. But suppressing it is also not a solution, I think. So this is something I'm working with and playing with. I want to give you a bit of context of what I've gone through in my life um, that has made it necessary for me to think about psychology, these internal processes, and learn and try to, to feel better being Dorian, you know, being with other people, um, being a, yeah, a member of society. So I'll talk a bit about some heavier things, heavier experiences. 
advert adverse childhood experiences they're called in therapeutic context if you are someone who's triggered easily this is my warning it's not super intense but yeah you're warned and maybe you need to step away for a moment that's okay this is me at age five or six and i always thought i was just shy but looking back now understanding much more about myself i understand that i wasn't shy i was really scared i was really wary especially of adults i had kind of learned that I cannot trust anybody. I cannot rely on anybody. In the end, it's all down to me. And I want to tell a little bit of, of what those experiences were that got me there. So my parents met in Austria. They were both immigrants there. My mom came from Switzerland. My dad came from Poland. And at that time, they had a small business fabricating paragliding equipment. So they had a small factory with sewing machines and you know putting paragliding equipment together that was a lot of intensity and a lot of demand on them they had i think about 40 workers in the factory they had me they had my sister who was a year younger they had to drive around europe to make deliveries and they were feeling like it's too much they they can't do it all so temporarily they gave me into the care of my grandmother in Poland, my dad's mother. And I was there for a couple months and they checked in regularly, you know, calling to see how I'm doing. And one day they got some information that no parent wants to get on the telephone or otherwise. They spoke to my grandma and she said, like hesitatingly that I'm not at home, I'm not with her, that I'm in the hospital. And she's not sure what's going on. And my parents, of course, immediately came to Poland, to Krakow, to the hospital. And they spoke with the doctors. And the doctor said that I'm really not doing well, that I'm severely dehydrated and malnourished. And I'm refusing to eat, refusing to drink. And that they, like I'm hooked up to infusion to just keep me alive and that they should not visit me because they've noticed that visitors really upset me. I'm very in deep distress after visits. So like, <laughs> not a good situation. And my parents were still in the, this is like a movie scene. My parents were still in the hospital and they saw my grandmother come arrive at the hospital and they were like, oh, what's going on? And they watched her go straight to my room which they knew she was not supposed to do. And she was in there for a bit. And then I started crying. Before then, I had been calm, but I started crying. She left. They, for whatever reason, didn't talk to her. They wanted to see me. So they came in and saw, like I was at the end of age two, I think, between two and three, really a small child, uh, really in bad shape. And they decided to take me home, but the doctor said they, they can't, I'm not stable enough. But my parents insisted, they had to sign some papers to say that they take full responsibility of what happens if they remove me from medical care. And I improved at home and at least physically, I think recovered mostly. There were some episodes where I would wake up and be completely rigid, like in a catatonic state. So my arms totally straight, my legs totally straight, can't move. And just in shock, like terrified. I don't know what happens. I have really warm memories to my towards my grandmother. Um, but something happened that really wasn't good in that moment. And then a few months after that, there was another experience that kind of compounded what I went through in this first experience. And that was that there was more pressure at the company for my parents. My dad started drinking as his father had done, which is a very common thing to be passing down through the generations. And he started becoming violent, 
and my mom yeah, at some point decided she cannot continue like this which drove him to the desperate act to take me and my sister and bring us to Poland and hide us from my mother and threaten her that she would not see us again unless she promises to stay with him which you know is not a really good strategy <laughs> but that was the best he could do in that situation like out of desperation out of love he wanted us to stay together and in that time somewhere he told us my sister me that my mother doesn't want us anymore like the three of us my dad my sister and me at some point she like agreed and they actually tried again but they didn't work so when he was on a business trip a few weeks later she um, kind of went to switzerland to to safety in a way and then a really nasty long divorce process like six years started where she my mom had to give my dad custody over us so that he would come and sign the divorce contract and he took us with with him and there was one time when my mom like there was a handover kind of where we went from my dad from being with my dad to being with my mom and my mom tells me that I was clinging to my dad not wanting to go to her and when she came closer I asked her mom do you still want me just like <laughs> heartbreaking I don't have memories of that moment but I think the body keeps the score there's a title of a book that was written about trauma I still carry that tension I think a lot of that tension from this early childhood experiences in my body and I've struggled you know connecting with people I feel really uncomfortable in parties or events usually throughout my life I don't go to these things or I have to force myself to go in the last 10 years or so it's gotten much much better I've done a lot of work and like the fact of <laughs> of me doing a talk like this on a channel that has an absurd 3.5 million subscribers or something like that it's like mind-boggling speaking in public and standing in front of the classroom was one of the absolute worst things that teachers could do to me so I've come a long way but there's still stuff in me that's preventing me to really do things that are good for me and connect really connect with other people and feel safe so maybe this resonates for some of you this is why I'm talking about this we don't hear about these things often I think but they're not that uncommon and you can do something about it like there is hope there is a healing path my mother studied um, stained glass painting as her first profession like that was her her trade that she learned and so she was really supportive for doing art and creative expression here's me back in Switzerland uh, supposedly pr probably in, in an art class or something like this and here's one of my first documented works a kind of dog bunny animal creature and I think the there's really interesting thing about art is that it's at this connection point between what is happening inside of us and what is manifesting in the in the world outside of us this image here is a painting I did around 2007 I think and it came out of a therapy session where I was working with a therapist to look at my childhood experiences and see if we can shift some of these things if we can melt some of these this fear that was frozen in my body and just as I was talking and explaining this image here popped into my mind and after the session was over I sat down and did a pencil drawing first and then a few days later on the version in oil this is kind of a, a depiction of how I felt for most of my life the jelly thing 
is a protective layer around the center, which is, I call it the pearl of pain, which is like a black hole, like a super dense pain that's protected by all this jelly, but it still has a lot of gravitational pull. So my head, my attention is there, but I can't get to it, I can't touch it. And then my hand is reaching out for help. Sometimes we're in a hole and sometimes we can climb out of it. Sometimes it's temporary, but sometimes the hole is so deep and we've been there for so long, we really need somebody else to help us out. Like someone who brings a ladder so we can climb up that ladder. And what I want to do in the next, whatever, 45 minutes or so is to show you some types of ladders and where you can find some of the ladder bearers, people carrying ladders around, helping other people. I've heard many times people who have healed trauma become healers themselves. I feel like I'm still before that threshold. I, I have not resolved the really core thing and I'm working on it, but I feel that pull to be, to be useful in this way. So let's go. In preparation, I tried to gather some of the most common challenges that we face as a community of artists and people are making things. Some common ones that I've experienced and maybe you've experienced are self-doubt, the famous imposter syndrome, social anxiety and isolation. And that is a big one for me. Comparison, like looking at other people's works on Instagram or in art books which can lead to feeling hopeless or envious. Perfectionism, also a big one for me, <laughs> has its good sides, but definitely its negative sides. Financial stress and pressure, which I've experienced as well, and many of you, I'm sure, as well. Lack of self-worth, procrastination, creative burnout, and many more. Many of these are connected, and that is also a good thing because working on one of them can unlock mm, challenges or blocks in other areas of your life. If we were in person, doing this in person, I would now kind of look out and scan, look at the room and see how people are feeling. Um, we don't have that, I have the chat over there. So I wanna use the chat and ask you, what is most pressing as a challenge for you or maybe for people around you, your friends, your community? If you had to kind of put a, put a word to it or two, three words, what is it that you see is really affecting people negatively in the sense of like inner challenges? You can put that in the chat then. It helps me to tailor what I have prepared and emphasize those things that you are calling out more um, and maybe spend a bit less time on the other ones. Okay, I see something coming up. What's the most, ah, oh, sorry. Thank you, Steven. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, the live stream is delayed by, I don't know, 30 seconds or so. So now I'm not sure how to bridge the awkward gap until I can see your responses. Steven, do you have any ideas? Uh, I think honestly, the biggest thing that I think is probably going to come up in here uh, and we see kind of jumping in is people feeling uh, demotivated by the current art world. Um, there were a couple commenters who responded to just the posts that we had about this stream upcoming. Uh, and they brought up just the idea of having a hard time being a creator currently, um, isolation and some other concepts like that. And now here with the chat coming rolling back in, I see some of that in there. Yes. Do you, do you want me to? A lot of isolation. I'm, I think I'm good. I'm okay. exactly. Nailed exactly. it. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. You know, very, a lot of these things, maybe this helps also to see the thing you wrote. Probably three other people also wrote it. 
So you are not alone in this. So what can we do? This is the, the subtitle of my talk, because we can sit here and like talk about our traumas and that won't get us maybe that far. So I've collected a few things that I hope are practical. There are three parts. Part one is frameworks, part two is tools, and part three is action. And then we all have time for questions or some discussion. So starting with frameworks, the kind of meta framework or the lens through which I'm looking at this is that I think of these challenges as, as something we can learn to navigate. So like you can learn how to do this. Self-care is a skill. Nutrition is a skill. Dealing with procrastination is a skill. And there are really smart people who have spent their lives studying these topics that we can learn from. And we can support each other. And we've created a Discord server with a section on mental well-being where we can support each other in these challenges and find solutions together. So everything that follows, you can kind of look at with this lens of these are skills, these are things we can learn, you can learn, and I can learn, and I'm learning actively. <laughs> so the first framework here is called the relationship grid. This is really fun and interesting, I think. It's a way to have a language for what's happening between you and maybe your intimate partner or your family members or your coworkers, kind of dynamics that repeat. And having a language for it makes it much easier to navigate. So Terry Real, who's a couples counselor, I think, maybe there's a different title that he uses, but that's how I think of him, came up with this model of there being a spectrum of intimacy from being walled off on the left. That is when you or someone you know, it's just, you can't get through them. There's the wall, there's no communication. And on the right, being boundary-less is when someone is unable to put up boundaries and lets other people trample all over them. Or the other way, when someone doesn't respect boundaries and is the person who tramples all over other people. Both of these are extremes that are out of balance, that are not healthy, that don't serve you, and in ways in which other people ways of conflict, basically. So this is left to right on the x-axis, but there's also a y-axis, top to bottom. At the top here, there's grandiosity, feeling like one is one up, feeling superior to other people, putting oneself above other people. And then at the bottom here, there's shame, being one down, putting oneself below other people being less worthy, less important. This gives us four beautiful quadrants here, and we can explore each one. So top left, someone who is being walled off and in grandiosity might say or think something like, I don't need anyone. I have all the answers. I don't need your sympathy. It's like island of one. On the top right, being still in grandiosity, but now boundary less, is the behavior of, I know what's best for everyone. This is someone who puts their rules, their perspective on other people without any consideration. Bottom right, being boundaryless, but one down, is someone who might say, love me, love me, I'll do anything if you love me. Maybe you know people like this, or maybe you get pulled into that mode sometimes. Bottom left, being in shame and walled off, is nobody cares about me. This is where depression lives. Here are a few more descript descriptors <laughs> describing words. On the top left, being high and mighty, passive aggressive and indifferent, because walled off and one up. Top right, being emotionally volatile, controlling and scolding, being one up and boundaryless. 
And then bottom right, being anxious, manipulative, and desperate. When in shame and boundaryless. And then bottom left, being withdrawn, depressed, and self-medicating. So these are like centers of gravity for different people. If you think of your parents or your partner and yourself, you probably have a tendency to go to one of these corners more often than the others. And if you can learn to recognize that, you can, and I love this, this sentence, you hear it a lot in the therapeutic world. You can, like, if you can see it, you don't have to be it. If you can see it, you don't have to be it. So you can see what's going on, then you're stepping out of being that. You can name it and you can change it. You can flow with it. Your partner might call out and say, hey, I'm noticing I'm feeling in shame. I'm feeling one down and I can't respond to what you need from me right now. And you might say, yes, I, I see, I feel that. And I'm feeling quite walled off. So let's come back together and find a better dynamic. That is the relationship grid. And by the way, like I put a lot of energy in making these slides and I want to make them available for you. So at the end, there's a link. Or maybe Stephen, if you want to put it in the chat, I think we can share it now, um, where you can download a PDF summary of, of everything I'm talking about. Thank you. All right, next framework, the physiology of well-being. What's happening in our body? There are many things we could talk about there. And one of the most important that I've come across is vagal theory or polyvagal theory, which is about the vagus nerve, which you can see on the right here, the vagus nerve is connecting all of the different organs of the body. It is the connection between your gut, your heart, your lungs, your brain. It is, it has a huge effect on how activated or alarmed you feel or how calm and relaxed and able to engage and connect with other people you feel as i mentioned before this is a top down and the bottom up system so you can affect the vagus nerve through the thoughts you have the images you create in your mind and you can affect the thoughts you have and the images you create through stimulating using your body in certain ways that I'm going to talk about. Another image of the things that the vagus nerve has an effect on. And the, the if you're curious about understanding this better, and not just intellectually, but physically putting it into practice, there's an amazing resource for that, which is the book Anxiety Rx by Dr. Russ Kennedy. I really, really love this book. And it's helped me a lot to regulate my own emotions, my own state. For things like public speaking, like we're doing right now. Um, but throughout the day, I get overwhelmed easily by demands. And this book has been really helpful to develop that skill of regulating and becoming much, much more resilient. So highly recommended. Change, you can see in, I'm presenting two ways here. Change can be doing something new, which I've also cultivated. I have actively cultivated neophilia, the love of the new thing. Um, I could tell a couple of stories <laughs> that are fun of things I've done. And change can also be stopping doing something you have been doing, stopping repeating patterns. The challenge is that many of these patterns are things that feel like they're happening to you. Like an alcoholic will have the experience of all of a sudden holding another empty beer in their hands. They don't really know how the bottle got into their hand and why it's already empty again. It's happening unconsciously and that is the big challenge and that's where we kind of can tie back to light and shadow shadow is the unconscious 
if we can shine light on it or bring it out into the light and talk about it and see it, then you can see it, you don't have to be it, you can work with it. And some of the tools I'm going to talk about are about that work, like making unconscious things conscious. And sometimes also working with the unconscious like, or working with the body directly. We don't have to talk about what happened to you for 25 sessions over however many years. You can work with movement, with touch, with dance to shift some of these things. Okay, next practical hands-on thing for you to do. As I was talking the last 10, 15 minutes, what stood out to you as being particularly useful? From everything is a skill to the relationship grid and the physiology of well-being. Relating to the goal you set or the thing you want to learn, what can you take out so far? Write this down on the same piece of paper if there's space. If not, get a second piece of paper. I'll give you a moment to do that again. Darren, is there any any of these that kind of sticks out for you as an individual that's the most useful? It can be all of these also. Well, I should say it's been super, super, super hard to condense the material. I have mm -hmm. material for like three, four talks, like the one we're doing today. I had to like cut away and cut away and cut away. Mm -hmm. um, but out of these three, I guess number one, like okay. this is a the meta skill, the meta perspective, mm -hmm. or for, for me, seeing everything as being learnable. Yeah, I think it's an important thing to keep in mind. Um, don't a lot of times people will look at something that they see uh, and just appreciate that it exists, but not approach it themselves. Um, the one that personally I liked the most was that relationship grid. That was mm. really interesting to see. Uh, interesting yeah. one. Um, here in the comments, we've got relationship grid, grid, uh, relationship grid. This is, that seems to be the one that's sticking out the most, um, except for uh, Abdul here did call out the skill-based paradigm. So yeah. Cool. Thank you. Let's keep going. There'll be a few more moments like this where you can write something down. If you want to share it in the chat, that's great too. Uh, you're more than welcome to do that. So there's some activity. And I think more important is that you take something for yourself. So we're entering part two of the meat of the talk, <laughs> or sorry for the, for the vegetarians and vegans, the, the protein <laughs> of the talk. Number one, oh, I should talk about I'll take a, a small detour to the topic of courage. Um, so I've, I've struggled a lot, like being in life, being an artist, being a person socially, like anxieties, blocks, and blah. And I've read a lot of books and I've done a lot of therapy. And sometimes there have been moments where I'm like, wait a second, like, what if the solution isn't another workshop or an ayahuasca experience or a therapy what if the solution in this thing i'm trying to do and somehow can't do what if the solution is just courage forget all that other stuff like actually it's just about i am scared to do that thing so i want to plant that seed in your mind whatever you're struggling with maybe the solution is just courage. And I think for all of us, if we develop courage, that is absolutely a muscle. That's something we can practice and get stronger at. I think it's a better world for ourselves, for our family, friends, something very much worth cultivating. So contact improv is something that took me courage and still I haven't gotten to do it much now in the last two, three years because I moved from Barcelona where I was most recently for a couple of years. I moved to the Swiss mountains to a tiny village in the Alps. So no contact improv here, but what contact improv is, is a 
form of dancing that is totally improvised. There are no rules. The only you know, rule-like thing there is, is that you maintain contact, physical contact with your dance partner. Usually that contact is initiated by the backs of the hands. So I'll see someone I want to dance with on the dance floor in the space, and I'll approach them and our hands, if they also feel like dancing, our hands will touch. And then it is a play of kind of push and pull and follow and lead. So if I lead and they follow, cool, we go. But at some point it will change and they are leading and I'm following. And the contact may become elbow to elbow or head to head. It looks fun. <laughs> it is super fun. And I would venture to guess that many of you would feel quite intimidated to join the dance floor. Uh, maybe not. If not, hey, good for you. That's great. I've done contact improv around, uh, maybe not around the world, but in different countries. And every jam I've participated in, usually that's the format. It's a jam, like an open session. Anyone can come. Sometimes there's a donation. Sometimes it's free. Usually it's like once a week, jam like that. Wherever I've gone, the environment has been really safe. People really take good care of each other. And it's about play and touch. Like we are starving for touch. We are mammals. We are, touch is really, really important. And if you live in a biggish city, there's a good chance that if you look up contact improv, you might find a jam. And it's like con uh, improv theater or something like that, which is like, for most people, terrifying. But then you go and you find, oh, everybody else, when they started, was also terrified. So they're very understanding and very encouraging. So for me, this uh, fulfilled many needs and kind of rewired that anxiety that I had carried in me from my childhood experiences, where other people were usually a threat to my, like subconsciously, to my system. I remember one time I was in Barcelona and in the past, it was a, a pattern of mine to be walking down the street and I see someone walking towards me and I'm like, uh, I don't wanna have that awkward meeting. So I'll pretend I have to go over there. So I cross the street and walk on the sidewalk to avoid that person which sure, sometimes that's fine if there's a creepy person, but it was a, like I didn't really want to do it, but I felt like I had to do it. And after a few months of contact improv, I was going to school one morning to teach, going to the subway station. And I walked down the street, the sidewalk, and this older gentleman was walking towards me. And the first thought I had in my mind was, oh, I wonder how I can initiate contact dance session with this guy, <laughs> which is such a different experience in my mind and body than like, oh, I don't want to have this encounter. I need to get away. I had shifted into a playful, like much more positive attitude towards meeting other people. So contact improv, highly, highly recommended. Also, if you want, yeah. Like, have a safe space to get close to other people. And yeah, I could talk more about that, but highly recommend it. Leading into like from contact improv, we're talking about tools. There's just no way to overstate how important it is to move your body. Like, thousands of studies showing all the health effects of movement, exercise, like that can be in the gym, that can be dancing, that can be playing sports, I don't care. But if you're not moving, you're gonna, you're dying. <laughs> like, it's not a good thing. Some things that have been shown, and you probably all know this, but just re-emphasizing. Movement, exercise enhances your mood, it reduces stress, relieves anxiety, improves the way you think, like cognitively, 
For example, have you had a meeting while walking on the phone compared to having that meeting sitting in a chair? Huge difference. It boosts your self-esteem. It decreases depression, increases emotional resilience. It's a way to interact socially with people, enhances creativity because you're doing complex things with your body and improves your sleep quality, which is very, very important and very close to my heart because I have struggled with sleep for a long time and it sucks. <laughs> so move. <laughs> I'm including this picture because I'm proud of, of training. It took me a long time to, to have a regular uh, workout practice. And every time I train, I feel better after having trained than I did before. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be going to the gym for you, but move, find a way to move. Then still tools relating to the body in the category of nervous system regulation, you can actually affect things in the so-called autonomic nervous system. It's not so autonomic, it turns out. Two main things I want to show here is NSDR, non-sleep deep rest, which comes out of Yoga Nidra, which is a, a way to, to train your body to relax and calm down, center, ground. So if you're someone who's always like hyperactive and has a hard time letting go and relaxing, this is something that can be very helpful. There are many sources. I really like uh, Rosalie at Rosalie Yoga on YouTube. She has a few NSDR protocol sessions. And if you're interested in the science, Andy Huberman at the Huberman Lab podcast explains what is happening in the body, why this works. I think he coined the term NSDR. And at nsdr.co, there's a few sessions you can listen to as well. And then there's working with the breath. Wim Hof is probably the most well-known uh, teacher of breathwork, Ranayama, very entertaining fella. And yeah, I think you'll just have to find the person that resonates with you. There's all kinds of different flavors, like the military guy who does breathwork, uh, known as box breathing, which might be interesting looking up. I like yoga with Adrian for regular yoga practice, but she has a few breathwork sessions as well. And Wim Hof, I think is solid. Okay, shifting gears a bit, a different type of tool is insight, having a new understanding of something. This happened for me recently with the concept of procrastination, which I'm a very experienced practitioner of procrastination. And it sucks. And there's some serious health risks, uh, which I learned recently, like heart disease, uh, stomach ache, chest pain, uh, like a bunch of risk factors are like double, triple, four or five times for people who procrastinate. Of course, you can use, like, lose your job. You are not getting stuff done that you want to get done. It's a big problem for many things, for many people. And what I learned that kind of shifted my understanding of procrastination is from Tim Pickle, who is a researcher who spent his whole life studying this topic. And he's come to the conclusion that procrastination is not a time management issue. It's an emotion regulation problem. So the solution is not to learn new time management skills. The solution to procrastination is to get to know yourself better, get to know your body and practicing regulating your own emotions. A phrase he uses often is giving in to feel good. Like by not doing the uncomfortable thing now, by putting it on tomorrow, it feels like I'm being responsible because it's not that I'm not doing it. I'm just not doing it now. I'm going to do it tomorrow. Good. But right now, oh, I feel much lighter because I don't have to do that uncomfortable thing now, like talking to 
my boss about getting a raise or something like this. I struggle a bit about how deep to go into this. and I don't understand it as deeply as I want. So I think I'll leave it at these kind of three approaches that, that he suggests, which is number one, noticing your own emotional state. Um, once you can see it, you don't have to be it. So I'm feeling anxious. I'm feeling afraid of this conversation. Oh, okay. That is happening. That's now it requires emotional regulation. Once you see that, you can step outside of it and then just simply focus on the action itself. And if the action is too big, you can break it down into a step that is small enough that you can do it. So with a conversation with the boss in that example, which I don't have that experience very much because I've been self-employed for most of my life, but many people do. You probably have your own examples of where you procrastinate. But let's say this example of talking to the boss, maybe a smaller step is to write down what I want to say to practice. Once I've done that, the step of actually picking up the phone and calling or going to the office is more doable. And if that's still too big, then find a smaller next step that you can do. And then third, and this brings us back to courage, is to commit publicly to create accountability. And I've done this with drawing. I've wanted to keep a sketchbook and have that practice, but I just couldn't make it work. There was too much resistance or whatever, just for months until a friend offered to be my accountability partner. And the way we did it is quite intense, but I was, it was important for me. So you can do this too. You can do a simpler version or a more intense version. But what I did was I gave him some money, a sum that hurt me for him to hold like in escrow. But he now has this money. We set the parameters for me that was think for five weeks, five or six weeks, I don't remember now. Let's say for five weeks, I will draw at least six days per week. I will send you a photo of what I did every day. It doesn't matter what it is, it can be a scribble, like the quality, not important at all. Just at least five minutes, I think we said five minutes per day. I'll send you what I did at the end of the day. Um, I have, I think we said something like seven joker days, where if something comes up, and I can't do it, fine. I can use up these seven joker days. The key is my friend is the one who decides whether I fulfilled the contract. And if I missed more than seven days, then he will send that money to an organization that we determined beforehand that I really don't want to support. It can be a political party or some, some other organization that you strongly dislike. And what that does is it removes the conversation you have with yourself about whether you should draw now completely. Like there's no conversation <laughs> like, oh shit, I haven't drawn today. I don't want to ha happen. Like I don't want to want to see the consequence of failing my contract I have with my friend. So I'm just going to draw right now. Very effective. Does require some courage at the beginning. Closing the procrastination chapter here, there's a book by Tim Pickle, Dr. Pickle. And there's a conversation with Ali Abdal, which is quite uh, insightful, I think. And the website procrastination.ca to find out more. I've not read the book, but I imagine it's uh, useful because it explains the research. Another insight for me is that self-love is the soil that nourishes my well-being. Like if I'm a plant, I'm a flower or a tree, if the soil it doesn't have any nutrients or there's no water in it, I cannot blossom. And like, 
I'm not so interested in having superficial solutions to things, which like distraction, uh, drinking, all these things are superficial solutions. They make me feel better in the moment, but they're not getting to the root of the thing. And in all my like learning different things about this whole topic, when I trace things down to what is underneath that, what is underneath that, often I come to the relationship we have to ourselves. Really like being on my own side is something I've struggled with a lot and it's super frustrating. And it's something I'm working on cultivating. It's that there's not this internal friction, but there's internal unity that I feel like I can do things that serve me mini story i i worked on a project that was really exciting for january and february this month and i was working hard for it like really working intensely and enjoyed it and i was performing well like if you're looking at the output i was having and that project ended it was a project for someone who i respect and admire and felt privileged to be working with. The project ended and it was time to focus on my own things again, like my teaching, my website, YouTube channel. And I, it struck me like the contrast was so extreme that I was having a really hard time having, giving my energy to my own success, like the success of my own projects compared to the level of energy and enthusiasm I was having for this project of this other person. I think there's something there that's important. Like I want to be able to have the intensity of passion and, and work and effort for my own project, at least as much, if not more, to the projects of other people. Um, how are we doing on time? Let's see, one hour. This is up to you I and like, how you feel yeah. about being an hour into it. Um, I'm, I'm here for as long as you feel this journey needs to be. Uh, and as long as there are people here, they seem like they're here for it too. Yeah, I would want to stretch it out too long. Like I think we should end at 90 minutes. Okay. And I want some time for, for questions or like, brainstorming together. Okay. Um, Sounds good to me. Yeah. Um, and just just to spotlight something here in the chat, you've got a message from Blue saying, I'm rooting for a well-blossomed Dorian. <laughs> Thank and you. And stream back to you. <laughs> Beautiful. Yes. Me too, I think. And this is, I think making beautiful paintings is great and helping supporting each other in blossoming yes like there's some that's to me feels much more powerful and maybe I, that means i'm not meant to be a, an artist or a painter and more a whatever title that is but that is what i'm really passionate about and i feel like i have to do it for myself first maybe that's wrong maybe by doing it for you, with you, I'm also simultaneously doing it for myself, but we'll see. That's kind of the journey I'm on. So this image, I'm going to skip it. We'll, we can come back to it in a future talk encounter. It is about self-love. And if you really feel strongly, you can like vote for, for the story in the Q&A. Maybe if we have time, we can come back to it. Well, let's keep, oh yeah, we have to skip this one too. Okay. Next tool, very practical, very simple is the waking up app. There are many meditation apps. I, I don't know if that's even the right category to call this app. For me, it's a more like an applied philosophy, psychology platform. And out of all the, uh, the meditation apps I've tried, this one is by far, like by far the highest quality information. 
three of my favorites. It's divided into theory and practice. And three of my favorites are the Alan Watts collection, which I love Alan Watts. I think he's one of the most gifted speakers and thinkers the world has ever seen. He makes me smile. He makes me relax about life. And it's just fascinating how he, he knows so much and brings together East and West throughout the ages, different philosophy. And yeah, I really love Alan Watts. Same for David White. He's a contemporary poet, powerful, beautiful work showing the, the power of poetry. He has two series on the Waking Up app. And then the Fundamentals course by Sam Harris, I also find really practical and, and useful. But there's much more. There's sessions on sleep, like guiding you into sleep, and different formats of meditation. The cost might put you off initially if you see the price, like, wait, this is an iPhone, Android app. It costs much more than other apps. But if you can't afford it, you can write to them and they'll give you either a free account or a reduced account. They don't want money to be an obstacle to people having access to that information, which I think is great and which I try to do in my teaching as well. Next is The Work by Byron Katie. This is a really effective method to kind of dismantle stressful thoughts you might have in any category of life. It can be about art, relationships, work, athletics, doesn't matter. If there's something that's stressing you out, bothering you, some conflict, you can use this process to find a different view on it and move beyond it. I would love to do it with you, but this online like live stream format is not really well suited. So I'll leave it at this. You can find out more about the four steps, four questions at thework.com. This is a tool I've used and many people I, I respect have used. Okay, now we're shifting to kind of the last bigger topic here, which is trauma. I spoke a bit about my experiences and there are some tools or methods for working with trauma that are better researched than others and known to be effective and useful. One of them is trauma releasing exercises and before I show more about how this works. I want to play a short video. I think this is okay to do within a live stream. These are other YouTube videos. Two of them are really old. I was not able to find the sources and they're on multiple other YouTube channels. And one, I have the source in there. Two of them have sound, but I think the way this sharing platform works, we don't have sound. So I'm going to narrate over it. We'll see. If yeah. you would, if you would like to play something with sound, you can, I think, uh, present a file. If you go to present, there might be a, an option here that says video mm. file. I think it's okay. Okay. We'll be a bit safer with copyright issues. I think if we don't have sound and um, I can narrate, but thank you for that. So we'll see you know, two animals, maybe three animals. <laughs> One is an impala, then an ice bear, and then a Navy seal. Here we go. So this impala was caught by a leopard. It's still alive. It's just in shock. It's in freeze. Fight, flight, freeze. This is freeze. The, the leopard gets chased off by some for some reason. And you see here very deep breaths at first. And what's happening now is shaking. This is a natural response of the body. There's a lot of intense chemicals rushing through the organism in a chase like that and being caught and like dying. And the shaking releases that. Here's a polar bear, similar. He's been um, uh, what's the word? Like 
shot with a dart, tranquilized. You see here, he's like coming to again and shaking, shaking it out. This is what happens naturally. Shaking, 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 and then very deep breaths. Let's start around now. The audio for this is really impressive. Very deep polar bear breaths. And this is processing the trauma, so it's not trapped in the body, like what happens often with humans. Animals can process this and then just go back to daily business after. Here's the Navy SEAL talking about having had an experience with this TRE, trauma release exercises, with a therapist, where he's describing it as kind of a nice feeling, like being massaged internally. Convulsing, but it's pleasant. And that there was yeah, a sense of release. And for him, it felt like there was a gas being released from his body. He doesn't know what, what that is, but it felt like something left him that was in his body before. And he had the best night's sleep he'd ever had after this. And yeah, processed his trauma from actual battle in the military. The next slide here has the titles of the three videos. I think this is it here. So you can look at these videos on your own. You can find them on YouTube with sound. And I think it's really helpful to see this actually happening in an organism, like in a body of an animal. This is what doesn't happen when trauma is frozen in a person. And going through a process like this can help release that. That's TRE. You can also find instructions online for doing this on your own. Probably it's better to do it with someone who is a facilitator, therapist, to guide you through it. But this is a very simple, natural way to work with trauma releasing. And here are the four methods that resonate most with me, resonate most with me and are really well researched. The first one is EMDR, eye movement, desensitization, and reprocessing. It is very strange that this works. You don't have to talk about what you experienced. This is a form of therapy that is purely biological. You just move your eyes and tap on your body. And for many people, it works very quickly. Then there's somatic experiencing, SE, which helps people with trauma who many of them have kind of left their body. They've gone up into their heads. They don't feel their emotions anymore as a way of, of self-protection. The, the trauma is frozen in the body. SE is a way to come back down into the body and start feeling again and processing trauma this way. And IFS, internal family systems, is a way to work with different parts of yourself that are in conflict and to bring them in harmony. Super fascinating and fun. I would like to do more in IFS. And there's CBT, which probably many of you have heard before, cognitive behavioral therapy. This is usually the standard um, talk therapy treatment because it's very effective. And there's trauma-focused CBT, which is especially useful for young people working with PTSD, anxiety, depression, and behavioral challenges. On the right here, there are the primary researchers and websites where you can find out more. You can take a screenshot, or again, I have a PDF of the important slides from the presentation that you can download at the link we will provide shortly. And it has been provided, I think, half an hour ago or so. Last tool, thank you, Stephen, that's the link. The last tool I want to talk about before we shift into discussion, Q&A, is humor, which for me has been really, really, really important. I've gone through some dark times I've gone through a divorce, 
which I want to talk about at some point too, because I think the way we did it was quite unusual. It's very, very sad. And at the same time, very beautiful the way we've done that, but not today. Today I want to talk about this experience I had with that partner, actually. Um, I had a, I woke up, this was in Barcelona, 2016, and I was just in a bad mood and could not get out of it. And at some point in the morning, I think I was doing some computer work or something. My partner passed by and she stuck a paper heart on my chest, like just cut out a heart and put some sticky tape on the back and just put it on my chest. And I looked at it and I was like, rrr, 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 rrr. part of me wanted to, to, to not be grumpy anymore, but I just couldn't. I was so deep in it. Then half an hour later, she passed by and put a paper crown on my head. And I, I, I wanted to come out of it enough that I didn't take off the, the crown or the heart, but I just, oh, I was just stuck in, in the suck. And later still, she did not give up. She came by again and she put a cape around my shoulders. I still, still insisted on feeling bad until at some point I had to go to the bathroom and I passed a mirror in our apartment and I saw myself for the first time, like how silly I looked. Like, how can I be so, so upset and grumpy being dressed like this? So finally something cracked and I was able to let go of that heavy feeling and laugh or chuckle at least and go to my partner and give her a hug and thank her for being so persistent in trying to cheer me up and to kind of commemorate that moment or like, yeah, capture that moment and that lesson. I decided to paint myself in this outfit <laughs> and I still have that painting and it's, it's a fond memory I have and I hope it makes you smile. I miss that apartment and I miss my friends in Barcelona. If you're watching this, big hugs. All right, part three, action. This is very short, just a few slides and then we'll do questions. So what courageous action can you take to get yourself closer to the thing you want? The thing you want to learn or the thing you want to change or the thing you want to experience? What is that? What can you actually do? What do you know you should do, but you're just missing a bit of courage? Write that down on the same piece of paper if you can for yourself. I'll give you a moment again. If you were doing this action for yourself currently, uh, what do you think mm. that you would write? Mm. I need a moment to consider that, okay. which may be good for a bit of quiet time for people to write. Thank you for asking. <clears throat> I'm really not sure. I think doing this talk and committing last November to do the talk at career camp was an important courageous action. Mm. Um, moving forward, I'm in a space now where it's, I feel pretty open. Like I love teaching the shading course and doing that live with people, providing feedback, going through that whole journey together. I want to keep doing that. And I feel really like pulled to doing work like this, what we've been doing today. I don't know what, what to call it yet or what form that will take. Mm. So making some kind of public announcement about that, I guess would be something, a courageous next action, but okay. I don't know, don't have it grasped enough yet. It's fair. Yeah, it's it's a lot. I think it's there's a reason that this is a um, kind of a meditative experience, something to think on. You don't necessarily have to have the answers all at once. Yeah. Um. 
so there there are a couple people here responding to this um someone was talking about attending an in-person art session um talking to themselves it's another thing to commit to it's an important exercise um i don't know yeah there's a couple of those um for person here in the chat yes this will be available afterwards i'll hand it back to you dorian cool thank you all right yes if you like this this question was meant for you to have a next action and make it practical like call person x or announce publicly i will do y like something simple not i choose to be a great artist i <laughs> think that's way too abstract make it really practical something you can say did i do it or no and if you want to use the opportunity to share it publicly to create some accountability for yourself by all means put it in the chat Okay, what's next? There are kind of three things that that you can do or you can take from this. Number one, there's a Discord server called the Drawing Dojo, which is public, where previous students of mine host drawing sessions regularly, and where we also have a section dedicated to mental well-being, where it's new, and all of you who are interested in that topic. I would invite you to come there and continue, start and continue that conversation together to be useful for each other as we blossom, help each other blossom. Then I talked about wanting to do something, but I don't know what that's gonna be. So if you wanna know as soon as I know, then you can sign up for an email list where I'll keep you informed about whatever comes, comes to be here. And then I mentioned before, there's a PDF, a summary, because there's a lot of information that I just kind of dumped on you. If you want to go back and read any of the details or get some of the links, you can download that. Thank you, Stephen. The link is in the, is it in the chat too? If not, maybe some someone can put it in the chat so people can click it directly in the chat, but it's on screen now twice <laughs> or there's a qr code that you could scan if you're that kind of person on screen so now we have what time is it yeah 10 13 13 minutes for let's say questions but also anything you want to say or share like yeah there's a community here i think of artists, of creative people who's, who have an interest. And my guess is if you're interested in this topic, it's not out of leisure. <laughs> it's like, for me, it's out of necessity that you want to understand these things better to make life, like to reduce suffering in some way. If you have a question or if, a statement too, I really appreciate it if you can condense it into one or two sentences to keep it as short as possible. And that very process of narrowing down, sharpening, crystallizing your question, that process in itself will bring some clarity to the question you have. And if you really don't know, like you can also explore in writing. So now again, we'll have a bit of lag between me right now who's living slightly in the future compared to you watching the stream, but uh, we'll manage. There's a first comment here from Pedro um, who, who says, how to get out of the anxiety freezing state when doing art. Hmm. I would recommend you the Anxiety Rx book. There's a process there that's called the ABCs, which the whole book is centered around that practice. And I'll, I can cover it quickly, but if you want to understand it more deeply, I recommend the book, or maybe there are interviews with, with the author, Dr. Russell, Russell something. You can look for Anxiety Rx, the book. The process is A for awareness, so noticing the anxiety, or the alarm, which he calls it, in the body. B is breath, so the way well, I've learned this from him. So the way I do it now is to take my hand and put it on my chest 
if I'm noticing that I'm uh, freaking out, even freaking out slightly, put my hand on my chest and I notice my breathing, like my rib cage expanding and getting smaller. And then I'm the ABC, we're now in B. The C is for compassionate connection. So I am just being here for myself, being the parent that I wish I had that wasn't here for me. That is like when you're feeling anxious, when you're drawing or painting, A, notice, have awareness that this is happening. And then just put your hand here and stop for a moment, pause and be here for yourself. Ready. So there are a couple others here. So um, Cosmics asks, how do you fight off the feeling of demotivation to reach your goals and make sure you do practice to reach them? I mean, I'm trying just like you to figure all these things out. So like we're figuring out together. The <laughs> first thing that comes to mind when I hear that question is community. Like have a few other people who are rooting for you or who are or who are pursuing the same goal, that you are continuously reminded that you're not on your own. That yes, this is hard and let's support each other to keep going. Mm -hmm. um, Abdul asked, how do you go through a project with tools you don't wanna use? Uh, and the things that they cite are like cheap drills and screws. I guess this might most apply to someone who's doing work that like uh, for higher work, um, maybe let's expand it to something more like, how do you do work that you don't want to have to do, but you have to do? Mm, maybe I'm not a good person to ask that. That's fair. I probably wouldn't do it, but yeah. and I've heard other people who are professionals talk about this, that yeah, not every project is something you enjoy. Sometimes it's the subject matter, like you're working on a TV show about a topic that you really don't care much about. I think the people at last that have long careers make a decision to find something in any project that interests them. Mm -hmm. Some people I think would advise to just like shut up, put your head down, get the work done. You're a professional <laughs> from that. In some situations, I think that's the right approach and that works. And for some people, that's the right approach. For me, I've done so much self-flagellation, like putting myself under so much pressure. Mm -hmm. That is not the path I want to take. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, for me personally, if I'm having to do something that I don't want to do, um, I try to apply something or find something in there that I think would be exploration. Um, sometimes, I think as we all know as artists, I think it's important is to push yourself outside of your comfort zone uh, and doing something you don't want to do might end up with you finding something that you enjoy. Um, there is one actually in here that I think a person said as a negative um, that's jumping ahead a couple questions, but I think you would actually want to answer. Uh, Anima yeah. asked, Let's what do does it. this have to do with art? Uh, if this has nothing to do with art for you, awesome. Great. Let's go <laughs> make art. Yeah, I agree. Um, and maybe this is a, a different read, a different solution, like what I mentioned about courage. Like maybe the solution is not to take psychedelics or take go to therapy. Maybe the solution is just to, it's just courage, just do it. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I honestly, like I think, uh, like you said, if this isn't something you deal with, fantastic. Um, but I think that we all know that this is a, a struggle that plenty of artists have, um, whether that's you or somebody else. There are a lot of questions here. Do you want me to just kind of catalog these for you to possibly answer in some way on social media? Or did you want to go through them? Because we've got probably a solid like 12 questions here. I think we can do a few more. We can okay. go until the half hour. Yeah. Okay. So ZH, ZH Art Studio asked, um, what is that experiment or project or a contribution to society or in art education you have not done yet? Hmm. Maybe something like what I've done today, but more as a, as a transformative format that has a start and an end. 
like to solve a particular problem, which I don't feel so confident in my ability to do, but maybe I am, or maybe together we can do it. Fair. Uh, John here um, brought up something that I think you, you would be uniquely uh, suited to answer. How do you fight the feeling of inadequacy when it comes to your drawing skills and where you are in art in relation to others' journey? You mentioned being uh, like dealing with some perfectionism at one point, which is kind of the like the emblematic idea of this. Yeah, uh, I don't have a good solution. I think I'm still struggling with that. Mm. Um, I don't know if this is directly relevant, but, but what came to mind is the phrase, don't build confidence, build evidence. Hmm. Like just doing more work to, to show yourself that you can do it. Mm -hmm. But I guess it's slightly different. Mm. I yeah, think I'm not sure. Maybe someone, maybe you have, have some uh, input or someone in the chat if you have thing... thoughts that I, I always try to remind people of is the those pieces that when you were working on it, you thought this thing is terrible. It's atrocious. Uh, and then you end up settling on it and then moving away from it. It's fine. And then you look back on it later and then you're like, you know, that was actually amazing. I used to make some really good work and I thought this was terrible. Um, in those times when you're feeling that, when you're in the actual pit of it, I think it's really important to acknowledge that you've been through that thing before and you will get to the other side of it and know that the work that you've made has value. So to acknowledge that past journey that you've been through while you're in the middle of it is really, really strong. It doesn't mean you're necessarily going to just suddenly go, ah, no, yeah, this is great. It's been great before. This is also great. But knowing that you can just keep working on something and you can have a good result, it's very important. Um, yeah, that, that insecurity also keeps you pushing to make the thing better. It's mm -hmm. also really useful. Mm -hmm. um, Cynthia got brought up something here that I think is at the core of a lot of questions in that people are asking. Um, people asked uh, about not having finished something in the past, having a million projects, you know, a million irons in the, irons in the fire, but they added mm -hmm. one additional thing. Um, I think this will answer a bunch of those questions. Um, with ADHD, I have perhaps over 100 unfinished paintings. Suggestions on how to finish. Do you have suggestions on how to just finish projects, projects in general? I'm pretty bad. I don't know if there are hundreds, but... Probably aren't 30. <laughs> you just looked over at your, your wall of works in progress. Yeah, there's a stack. Yeah. Um, what comes to mind is make a public announcement. Mm -hmm. Like commit. If this is important to you, maybe it's not important to you to finish. If you're not a professional artist, who cares? If you have to make a living, well, you will learn to finish things pretty quickly because otherwise you can't pay rent and food. Mm -hmm. Um but like setting up an exhibition can be really helpful. Booking a venue and saying, this is the date, the opening night, and then you have a deadline. And maybe you will feel the night before setting up that all these ADP uh, pieces you chose are still all un unfinished, mm -hmm. but you put them up anyway, and maybe half of them sell because people love the unfinished look. And to them, they're totally finished. Mm -hmm. But, I think that's yeah. that's an important yeah. one. I think, like you said, the the like a, having a, a deadline of sorts that you set for yourself. Uh, I think we've all had those situations in life where having something like that, a time where you have to have something turned in or have something to display to others, whether that's school or anything else, it helps in a very big way. Makes you do it. It yeah. makes you work with the thing. And it's not necessarily you settling for something lesser than what you would make otherwise, but it makes you work. Yes, part of why this is a live stream and not a video I produced on my own is because that's a hard deadline. Yeah. <laughs> I had wanted to turn the talk that I did in November into a video and put it on my channel for months. 
and I just had other stuff that is more urgent. Mm -hmm. But then my uh, collaborator said, let's make it a live stream. And I was like, uh, I'm a bit scared, but okay, let's do that. And then we got a date and here we are. Mm -hmm. And yeah, <laughs> it forced me to put the things together. That being said, I would still love to see something like this. Like if you chose to t tackle any one part of this and something like shorts or reels, you know, mm. um, also making you have a hard, like a editing requirement of just that one minute, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, Shauna Bass asked, uh, what happens if you work up the courage, but your result is still poor? It can reinforce those negative beliefs. Yeah. Life is hard. <laughs> Art is hard. Uh, maybe a community helps there also, like you're not alone in that feeling. Maybe a good teacher or a mentor or a coach can help you there. Um, yeah, I mean, that's real. That's life. Mm -hmm. like, that's something to overcome. Yeah. And you can give up which is fine. Maybe then art is not that important. Maybe, yeah, you do something else that you, or that doesn't happen. Um, or you stay with it and find a way through those valleys. Mm -hmm. I think it's much easier to get to do it together. And for me, for such a long time, I felt like I have to do it alone. Like I have to do everything alone. I didn't know how to connect with people. I felt awkward and lonely and uh, <laughs> and over the last few years i've become more at ease with who i am and more able like the skill of communication also like better skilled at talking to people mm -hmm. and i've discovered how much fun it is to collaborate rather than trying to do everything myself mm -hmm. so I community matters and i think in the next years with all the technological advances uh, that are happening, community and, and trust and being here for each other is going to be just more and more important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree uh, very much. And I think another thing to keep in mind when you find yourself pushing for something really hard and you fall flat, you don't necessarily get the result that you want, is to remember that a failure isn't necessarily the end of anything except that one particular like a basically experiment of art. The the things that you fail at from that can apply to the things that you make in the future. If every failure is the like a key to having a future success. And if you if you don't feel motivated from those failures to attempt at a new success, like you said, maybe this particular thing isn't something that you really need to do. That's okay. Yeah. It might not okay be the thing to let go of projects too. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, it, it's okay. You don't necessarily need to do all of those things in this exact moment. You might not need artist expression right in that moment either. If you're not a professional artist, like you said, who, where you're paying your bills with this thing, that's okay. Let it happen. Uh, I'm going to switch back to um, the QR code here. Um, do you, If you want to just like give one last little explanation of this, and then we'll wrap up here. Sure. Um... I want to say one short thing too that just came to oh, mind yeah. as you were speaking now. <clears throat> I think for many years I felt like the problem was that I wasn't drawing enough. I wasn't painting enough. Like I've invested so much energy and time and money into my training. Why am I not painting? Like I just, I just need to draw and paint more and everything would be better. Until I had a shift where I realized that I make myself feel bad in many different situations and contexts in life. And not drawing and not painting is just another way in which I make myself feel bad about myself. Mm. It's not about drawing more. It's about learning to be on my own side and not to be like beating myself up and making myself feel bad all the time. So if that resonates for you too, some of you who are listening, and if you are open-minded, I recommend the book Existential Kink by Carolyn Elliott. It's pretty out there. It's pretty uh, unintuitive, but very interesting. Hmm. All right. So 
the QR code here will lead you to a page where you can join my public Discord server. There's about 700 people there drawing together, sometimes daily, which is super cool. And there's a section on mental well-being. There's an email list where you can stay informed on any courses or things related to this topic that will come up. And there's a summary PDF of all the materials that I shared today. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Proco team, for being also open-minded to have a conversation like this on this channel, which I think is really cool. And I hope it was helpful for all of you watching, listening. Yeah, me too. Um, just Let's as support a each other in blossoming. Absolutely. Uh, just as a reminder for anyone who is interested, um, you can get Doreen's course, which was recently updated, uh, that you can follow uh, follow along at your own pace at proco.com slash Dorian. Um, there is also, like um, with that QR code, you can get that course with a little bit more guided uh, and direct feedback with Dorian over at shadingcourse.com. Uh, and for anyone who's looking for some feedback um, but maybe doesn't use Discord, um, you can get some uh, some community feedback, um, participate, get some critique, uh, things at proco.com slash community. It's entirely free to make a Proco account. We recommend it. Um, so yeah, Dorian, thank you so much. If people want to follow you on socials, I think you're Dorian Visuals on most things, but you are Dorian Eaton on some as well. But Dorian, Dorian Visuals is yes. the one on Instagram. Yes, Dorian Visuals at Instagram and Dorian Eaton on YouTube. There's more coming on both mm. of those places, but especially YouTube. Fantastic. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you. Uh, have a good one, everybody. Take care of yourselves.